years ago Went out in sin I had no hope No peace within Down on my knees In agony I prayed to Jesus And he gladly set me free I never shall Forget the day When all the burdens from my soul rolled away it made me happy glad and free i sang and shouted for he's everything to me By my side, my feeble steps, he comes to guide. When trials come, he comforts me. Through faith in him, or sin, I have the victory. Sing I never shall forget the day when all the burden from my soul rolled away. It made me happy, glad and free I'll sing and shout it for he's everything to me It made me happy, glad and free I'll sing and shout it for he's everything to me So world's no place for living Not enough care, not enough giving Sometimes clouds of sin and sorrow hide the way But this life and stormy weather Ain't gonna be my home forever I'm gonna be moving One of these days I'm gonna be moving Moving away Gonna be moving One of these days when I leave this life behind me, troubles and cares never gonna find me. I'm gonna be moving one of these Any time for crying, no more sickness, toil or dying. Joy awaits me in that mansion far away. When I rest from all my labor, Lord's gonna be my next door neighbor. I'm gonna be moving one of these days. I'm gonna be moving, moving away. Gonna be moving one of these days. When I leave this life behind me, troubles and cares never gonna find me. I'm gonna be moving one of these
up your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my up your holy
all your worries and trials and burdens. There's a Savior and He calls. Bring it all to the table. Oh, bring it all. no one that's turned away all you sinners all you saints come on in find your grace come on in take your place there's no one that's turned away all you sinners all you saints come on in and find your grace Bring it all to the table. There's nothing he ain't seen before. For all your sins and sorrows and sadness, there's a Savior and he calls. Bring it all. Ancient Israel heard his voice, how God shield and bid rejoice. As he led them through the deep red sea. In the wilderness they what a living God do. And I know he'll provide for me. God is You'll 
sitting there listening to him sing and I thought that song was about as good as I could get to <clears throat> segue right into what I was going to talk about so I figured I'd go right then. I told him to sing a couple more. I was enjoying listening to him. But turn on if you would to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, one verse of scripture. <clears throat> I apologize. My, I'm having a terrible time in my throat this evening. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, one verse. The Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I had a title for the message, now it would be blind faith. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your house. We praise you and we worship you for all the things that you've already done for us, Lord God. We, we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for every person here we pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear, Lord God, minds to understand, Heavenly Father, and hearts, God, to accept your word. In Jesus' loving, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blind faith. <clears throat> I had read a couple of things as I was researching. Helen Keller said the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. And an unknown author, I couldn't find the author of that, he said... He had been blind for 55 years, and after 55 years of having no sight, the only thing that I can say is that he said life is beautiful if you want it to be. So blindness didn't have to hold them back, they said. But in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, they call it, we have here written by the Apostle Paul, a record of individuals that he believed and excelled in the faith arena this is why many scholars and theologians refer to this chapter as the Hall of Faith. The text we have been led to refers to or attempts to define what faith is. A very familiar verse of scripture, but it def de attempts to define what faith really is. The faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance or the materialization of hope. The reality of the fantasy of hoping hoping for something it's become real the intangible things that a person's mind's heart or spirit has spent time hoping for are now tangible through faith faith has caused imaginary things to now have a feel because they can be touched they can have an odor because they can now be smelled they have an appearance because they can now be seen the latter part of the verse advances that very thought when it says the evidence of things not seen. As if to say that faith is somehow now the proof of things that were hoped for before. Those things that are no longer figments of an individual's imagination. They are not dreams that cannot be caught. They are not fantasies that cannot be lived. They are not desires that cannot be obtained. No, now faith provides the physical evidence that proves that dreams and fantasies and desires and hopes can be ours. The Old Testament was a year-after-year year journal of different people and the documentation of their lives, and it all pointed to a future man, the Bible calls him, a Messiah. That is of a, as of yet, in the Old Testament to them, he was not real. This Messiah was not real. They, they did not believe him to be a physical person for, because he had not already existed for thousands of years. People did not believe that the Messiah, Messiah existed yet. They spoke of and they searched for him and they waited for him as if he would one day exist. This, they thought, was blind faith. They were blindly faith, trusting in God that he would send this Messiah, that this Messiah, Messiah would exist. In fact, it was not necessary because Jesus, the Messiah, had existed the entire time. In Genesis 3 and 15, after the serpent has deceived Adam and Eve, God unveils his first clue of the Messiah. In fact, this is when hope itself was born. This is when faith was truly birthed into existence. God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. 
On the surface, this seems to mean that the children of all women and the, all the baby snakes to come will have a blood feud throughout eternity. In fact, this verse of Scripture means much, much more. The woman represents humanity. The serpent represents Satan. This seed is a, all of the evil that will spawn from this original instance of sin. That one sin in the garden. That one time that the enemy deceived. There would be more and more and more to come from that one time instance. And the seed... The seed that the writer talks about, this seed, he doesn't say seeds, plural, he said the seed of the woman, and that seed is none other than Jesus Christ. I obviously have to support that statement, and I can do so with the best thing, more scripture. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it is the apostle Paul again using references of a seed, but here Paul identifies who this seed is. He says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, and if he meant many, but as of one. He says, and to the, that seed which is Christ. So we see God eluding in the book of Genesis that humanity had reason to hope. They had a reason now to hope because God had told them that there's going to be a seed coming. There's going to be hope coming. There's a Messiah coming. Paul writing to the church in Romans chapter 5 verse 15 says, talking about this first mistake in the garden, the introduction of sin into the world. As I've already said, in fact, it was the introduction of hope and faith as well. Paul says this, but the free gift is not like the trespass. He said, it's this gift that I'm talking about is not like that original sin. He says, for if many died through one man's sin, one man's trespass, many more have the grace of God and the free gift in that grace. One man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many, he says. For the judgment following one sin brought condemnation. Adam's sin brought condemnation on the entire world. But the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of one man's sin, death Death reigned throughout the world. One man sent Adam sin and death ruled the entire world through Adam. But much more, Paul says, will those who receive the abundance, an abundance, he says, of grace and the free gift of righteousness in life through the one man. Not many men, not many seeds, not many ways. Paul says there is an abundance of grace, an abundance of righteousness, and it is found in Jesus Christ. Give God praise. He is the reason that we have hope and that we can have faith. Again, still in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah prophesies that a Messiah shall come. Isaiah 53, maybe the most familiar of all the Messianic prophecies. He says, who hath believed our report? He's describing this Jesus. Again, listen, and this is lengthy. I don't usually read this much scripture, but I think we need to go. He says, who hath believed our report? He says, unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Once again, he's talking about something that was not visible, but now God is making it visible. He's saying, you used to couldn't see this. You didn't know this. You didn't recognize where your hope was going to come from. He said, but it's going to be revealed. And Isaiah says, he shall grow up as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness. He's describing our Jesus right here. He says, and when he sh we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He says, he is despised and rejected of men. He will be a man of sorrows. He will be acquainted with grief. And we hid as if our faces from him. He was despised. This is Jesus again. And he says, and he, we esteemed him not. Surely, he says, he hath borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. He says, afflicted. But listen, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him. And with his strength. Stripes, we are healed. All we, all we, Isaiah says, like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before his shears is dumb. He openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. 
judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken, listen, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. He had done nothing wrong. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Listen, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for our sin because he had not sinned. He shall see his seed, he says. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Listen to me, church. I just described your Savior. I just described the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that was long. I know that took some time. I tell you what, I've got time to talk about Jesus tonight. I've got some time to worship that man that did that for me. He had no sin. He had made no mistakes. He had done nothing wrong. He had no shame. He had no guilt. And God said, I'm going to put Matthew Lee's sins on my son. I'm going to put Jackie Field's sins on my son. I'm going to put the pastor of West End's sins on my son. And I'm going to beat him. And I'm going to cause him to die for your sins so that you and I can be set free. Give God praise. We don't talk enough about that. We don't talk enough about what Jesus did for you and I. We call out to Him to, to have Him answer little things. They're little to Him. They're big to us. And we, we cry out and we pray. And we hit our knees and we fast and we pray for all of these things. And I think sometimes we forget He did the greatest thing already. He's not limited. He's not afraid. He's not backing up. He said, if I can cleanse your dirty heart, if I can set your soul free, I can meet all the needs that you have. Give God praise. If you and I aren't careful, it's easy to believe that God has required of humanity a blind faith for thousands and thousands of years. When in fact, He revealed in the very beginning that there was a promise. He said there's a promise. I'm going to promise that we could believe in, that we could have faith and hope in. That visible, invisible thing. The substance without substance is a man that had existed the entire time. Jesus had always existed. The world was not waiting on Him to exist. The world was not waiting. Humanity was not waiting on Him to exist. Humanity was waiting on Him to come. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Job cried out, I have sinned, what must I do? Not because he didn't know that his salvation could only come from the God that he prayed to. He knew that God would have to be the source of his salvation. No, Job cried out because even though the answer, this Jesus had already existed, he had not yet made that sacrifice. Jesus had not yet died on that cross. The blood of Jesus Christ had not yet sinned. So Job cried out and said, What must I day do but today if you and I have sin in our life, if we have wrong in our life, if we have made mistakes, if we call out to this Jesus, we don't have to wait. We don't have to search. We don't have to wonder because the sacrifice has been made. The blood has been shed and we can be saved. Our subject began with the title, Blind Faith. As I was preparing myself for this message, I realized early on that I would not be able to fit it all in one. So it will be a, probably two or three if, if the Lord wills. I had three thoughts and the first thought was faith to believe. We'll get through that one today hopefully. But secondly, I had faith to follow. And the last one was faith to receive. But before you can follow and receive, you've got to believe. Faith to believe. How do we get faith to believe? In Hebrews, we find a list of the champions of faith. And in that list, we find the father of faith, Abraham. Hebrews 11 and 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went. 
I referred to Abraham to the father of faith because Abraham was the first to be called out and away from where he was to make his way toward where God wanted him to be. God said, leave where you are and I'll tell you where to go and I'll tell you where you're going later, but I'm not going to tell you now. Just leave where you are. This call from God may have required Abraham to have what we call blind faith because Abraham had no example to which he could look back to. Abraham was the pioneer. He was to blaze a trail for the rest of us to follow. Let me sow a seed of thought right here. If it was required of Abraham then to have blind faith, if you want to call it that, hereafter then, after Abraham, after he did it, after he followed God, after he trusted God, after he believed, after he had faith, blind faith would begin to become unnecessary, wouldn't it? Because once, once one individual has believed and, and has received the substance and the hope of their faith, that indeed becomes the evidence that Paul's talking about. The evidence, the proof that the writer of Hebrews was referring to because they become an eyewitness and they can testify to it. Abraham left us a record. Abraham told us what happened. He told us what God said. He told us what he did. And he told us what God did. Are there any eyewitnesses here tonight that can tell the world anything that God has said to you. Anything that God has done for you. Listen to me church we're not operating in blind faith anymore because we have a record. I can look back to Abraham's life and I can look to it and it says if Abraham said this, God told me to leave and and Abraham left and then God was with Abraham each and every day. Every time an obstacle came up, God was with him. Then I don't have to wonder what God's going to do. He says I'm not a respecter of persons. If I did that for Abraham. He'll do that for Dwayne D. Board. He'll do that for Matthew Lee. We're not operating in blind faith. I'm a witness tonight, church. If you're wondering whether God will hold you, if you're wondering whether that rock will hold, whether that anchor will hold, let me tell you it will tonight. It will not move. You will not lose. God has got it. Give God praise. We don't have to operate in blind faith. Have we ever really examined what it really took for Abraham to believe? The faith to believe, what it cost Abraham. We're introduced to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. But to examine what this great faith cost Abraham, we will have to understand chapters 10 and 11. Genesis 10 and 11. In chapter 10, we're given the genealogies of the descendants of Noah after the flood and and that we're introduced to Nimrod, the son of Cush, The Bible says Nimrod was a mighty warrior and he conquered many places. He set up many cities and his headquarters was in Babylon. Then in chapter 11, we see that humanity has outgrown the need for God. They don't need him anymore. Read it. They don't need him. We're smart. We're strong. We know what we're doing. And in the city of Babel, they said, come let us make bricks and let us bake them. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to heaven. So that we may make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. There's, there's importance in that verse of Scripture. So let us make a name for ourselves. Therefore, if, you're, if you depend on your own name, then you don't need the name of God. If you, if you depend on your own strength, you don't need the strength of God. If you depend on your own intelligence, your own wisdom, you don't need any of that stuff from God. They said, we don't need Him anymore, let's, let's do without Him. It used to seem like that was too far-fetched to even imagine. As I heard that when I was young, I thought that there's no way that's even possible that they would try to build a tower to heaven and read the book. It's in there. A people believing that they could reach heaven by their own means. A people that would circumvent God, remove Him from the equation, attempt to reach heaven by their own intellect, their own device, or their own hands. But today we see that on a daily basis a portion of the world's population that believes they can wipe God and His rules away, that they, that like they can tear down the fabric and the, the structure of creation and they, they can tear it down like a statue that offends them. They can do away with it and they can reach heaven without God another way. But God moved in Nimrod's day and He proved that He was in charge and He will do so in our day. This is the situation which Abraham being the first of many, but he being asked to have faith first. This is what he was in. I had a couple of points. Abraham was able to have faith to believe first because he was able to hear God calling him. I thought as I, as I wrote that, I thought years ago, 
dad may get mad when I tell this. We was we was plumbing George Putnam's house out on the mountain. It's me and him out there. Back in the day, we didn't have a light under the floor. I, I was running back and forth. I was just a gopher, you know. I was going in and out getting plumbing and stuff. You can't ever have enough. And he's under the floor plumbing. He said, go out and get this. So I went out, and I had the flashlight. I crawled out to go get whatever we needed to get. And he hollered at me about when I got to the crawl space door. He said, hey, I need that can of glue. And it's a metal can of glue, you know, about this big. I could hear his voice under there. I could, I could hear him under there, but I didn't know where he was at. So I, I shined a light. I don't know where I could see him. When I saw him, I threw the can of glue. Trouble was, I blinded him with a light, and it hit him right in the mouth, busted his lip. So it was a disaster altogether. He got a little angry. He started out from under the floor. I don't know what he was going to do to me, but luckily he was so far under there, Pastor, that he stopped. He didn't come all the way out. He said, you big dummy, you blinded me, and then threw that can of glue at me. I could hear his voice. But I didn't know exactly where he was at. But hearing his voice made me think, hey, I can get this to him. Abraham had to be able to hear God calling him before he could believe. In a world full of noise, people that were doing, as the Bible says, a lot of talking in Nimrod's day. They were, it says they spoke the same common language. They all could speak the same language. And they had begun to feel like they were intelligent enough to remove God. With all of those people thinking and talking for themselves, they, the key to Abraham's faith was that he heard the voice of God. He was not hearing the noise. He heard God speak. He heard Him speak. And him, Abraham was listening. The key to our faith, my faith, your faith, is our ability to listen and hear the voice of God. The Bible says Abraham followed the God that appeared unto him and spoke with him. Jesus Christ says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He says, My Father gave them to me, and He is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my hand. Jesus Christ says, My sheep know my voice. They can hear me speak. Church, when all the noise that's going on in our lives, all of the doom, all of the gloom, all the negativity, all of the crazy you and I need to be able to hear the master's voice more than any time in all of creation we need to be, not hear the preacher's voice not hear the pastor's voice not hear these men singing but hear Jesus Christ speaking to you as the good shepherd he says if you're my sheep you will know who's speaking to you you will know what I'm saying to you we need direction we need confidence we need courage we need joy we need peace and we'll only hear, get those things if we we can hear God speaking to us. And listen to me, church. He says, if you hear my words and you follow my commands, he listened to what he says, nothing can pluck you out of my hand. Nothing. He said, the Father, God in heaven gave you to me and nothing can take you away. Give God praise. For Abraham to believe, he must be able to hear God's voice. Secondly, Abraham was able to have faith because he valued the promised inheritance over his present world's possessions. We're not sure how wealthy Abraham was before God called him out of the earth of the Chaldees, but, but everything he knew was there. His family was there. His career was there. His, he was familiar with that place. That was his comfort zone. His possessions were all there. The Bible says in verse 1, God calls Abram to leave the place he knew to go to a place that God would show him. He didn't even tell him where he was going. Verse 2 and 3 is the promise. This is the promise that, that helped convince Abraham to go. Listen, it says Abra God told Abraham to leave, and then he told him this promise. He says, I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse them, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That is the promise that God gave Abraham that convinced Abraham to go. Verse 8 says, Abraham left. He left where he was and he went and he pitched his tent where God told him to. Abraham decided to disconnect from this world. Abraham's living in a tent now. He leaves his home. He leaves the city that he grew up in. And he's living in a tent just to follow God. Abraham was no longer attached to things of this world. He lived in a temporary tent because he knew that he lived in a temporary world. 
He knew that if there was a God speaking to him, that there was something bigger than what was going on down here. He knew all the chaos, all the trouble. He said, this can't be all there is. If there's a great big God talking to me, then there's something else. And Abraham understood he lived in a temporary world. You and I have gotten too comfortable in this world. The church has traded its tents for more permanent dwellings. We're, we're living in attached lives to a temporary world. You say, what guarantee do we have? What do you and I have as human beings, as mothers and fathers, if we don't go out and make these guarantees for ourselves, if we don't gain as much as we can, earn as much as we can, if we don't make our own way, then what guarantees do we have? Acts chapter 3 verse 25 gives us an answer. He says, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. He said, you're related to Abraham. If you have given your heart to Jesus Christ, you have been grafted in. Galatians 3 and 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond or free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, Listen, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You say, what, what does that mean? Well, that covenant that I just read to you, the, the promises where God told Abraham, He says, if you'll follow me, I'll make you a great nation. I'll give you a great name. I will bless you. And if anybody, He says, anybody curses you, I will curse them. God says, I'll fight your battles for you. He said, I'll take care of you. That's Abraham's promise, right? That's Abraham's covenant. No, right here in Galatians, He says, if you're in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and you're an heir to that same promise promise. We have promises from God Almighty tonight, church. We are secure in the promises of God Almighty. I can claim the covenant that Abraham claimed. I can claim kinship to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and David and Jesus Christ most of all because Jesus Christ has adopted me into God's family. And He says, you are in the family and you have those promises. Give God praise. We are, we are not operating in blind faith. We are not trusting in ourselves. We're not trusting in our bank accounts. We're not trusting in the things that we can earn, the things that we can gain. God says those things can pass away. They can be taken away tomorrow, but your salvation cannot be stolen. It cannot be taken away. That is our guarantee. Lastly, Abraham took God with him everywhere he went. Everywhere he went. It's extremely important. We say God's with us. He's with us if we want Him to be. God is with His people. He says, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. But the Bible says Abraham took God with him. Verse 5 says, Abram, look. Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, when he left. And all their substance, they got to take some stuff with them. God let them take it with them. He's not against you earning and gaining things. He doesn't have a problem with that. He says, And he went into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came, and Abram passed through the land under the place of Sycam, under the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite were already in the land. That's the trouble with the Canaan land. It's full of Canaanites. Dad's favorite movie, Braveheart, the old English king. He's trying to rule Scotland. He says the trouble with Scotland it is full of Scots. That was the trouble for Abraham. He gets to the promised land. He gets to Canaan and it's full of other people. Abraham's like, well, I thought this was going to be mine. It's full of other people. So what, am he, what is he to do? Verse 7 says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Listen to this. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord. It says, Abram built an altar to the Lord who had appeared unto him. We can't stop reading there. Verse 8 says, And Abram removed from there, and he went into a mountain on the east of Bethel, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And he, listen, pitched his tent. And there, again, he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Everywhere Abram went, he took God with him. He had his altar, and God had his worship. Abram had his promises, and God had his servant. 
living in a world full of non-believers like Abraham had to, you and I have to. It can be discouraging. It can be difficult. So Abram took God with him everywhere he went. You and I need to take God with us everywhere we go. We are not a match for the enemy without God. We cannot defend ourselves without God. But that's just one side of the coin. The Bible says, with God, all things are possible. Through Him, all things are possible. He says we're not only overcomers, but we're more than overcomers. We're not only just victorious, we're more than victorious. We're conquerors, He said. I need, some th- I need to conquer some things in my life. This adversary has thrown some things into my life that I don't need to lose to. I don't want to bow down to. I don't want to be beat or whipped by the adversary. So I need to have victory in my life. I need to be an overcomer. I need to be conquering those things. And the only way to do that is to take... Take God with me in that fight every single day. Give God praise. Stand with me if you would, please. Crystal River, would you prepare yourself? I started talking about blind faith. Began first with Abraham and faith to believe. Abraham was able to have that faith because he heard God speak. He heard Him clearly, distinctly, I hear, I hear many people say this, and I, I've said it myself. I, I'd like to know what God wants me to do right here. I'd like to know what God's saying. I'd like to know what God would want, which direction He'd want me to go. He's going to speak to you. He's not going to tell you what you need to know tomorrow, today. He's going to tell you tomorrow. The key is we got to be listening. We have to have ears to hear, as the Bible says, over and over and over. We, you and I, have to be in tune. And hear what God is saying to us. I I need some answers that I can't come up with. God can do that. He can speak to you and I. Secondly, Abraham chose the promises of God over the possessions of this world. Get all you can get. I've heard our pastor say that my whole life. Get all you can get. There's nothing wrong with it. He let Abraham take what he had, some of what he had out of there. He's not against that. But they can't compare to the promises that God has for you and I. Nothing I can gain, nothing I can get will compare to that. And Abraham realized that early on. He realized that was more important. Lastly, Abraham took God with him. We already know that. As they sing us a song, before we can follow God and before we can receive from God, we've got to believe in God. The Bible says that He gives us all a measure of faith. He gives you enough faith so that you can believe in Him. Raise your hand if you have some needs. Then you and I, the first thing is we've got to believe in this God that we're praying to, this God that we're trusting in, this God that we're leaning on, this God that we're calling out unto. We've got to believe in Him. If they sing us a song, would you come tonight and let's pray together and allow God to help us grow our faith, strengthen our faith, Allow us to channel our faith, to block out the noise, open our ears, spiritual ears to hear what He has to say for us and say to us. Cry out to that God. When you come, understand who you're talking to. Understand that He has the power. He has the authority to change things. He has the authority to change the situation in your life. We've all know important people here on this earth and we can call them because they have authority and they can make a phone call for us or they can make a move for us and they can change something for us. They can help us get a job or, or they can help us get a home or they can help us get a loan. They can help us get all those things. I'm telling you to call the most important person you've ever known, Jesus Christ. Call on Him knowing that He has the power and the ability to do all of that and so much more. Cry out to that God tonight. Take your need to that God. Help us tonight, Lord, to believe. Grow our faith, Lord God. When doubt tries to creep in, help us, Lord God, to believe. When fear tries to creep its way in, help us to believe. When anger tries to come in, help us to believe. When discouragement and sadness and depression find its way into our life help us to believe that you're in charge you're in control and that all things shall be turned around for our good believe the promises in this book 
Help us to believe and trust in you, Lord God. Because our hope is in you. Our faith is in you. Raise your hand if you have a need. I'll come pray with you. Oh, behave.